So OpenAI just released two open source models that are taking the internet by storm. And in this video, I'll explain to you exactly why this is actually a lot bigger than you might think. So one of the first models that OpenAI released was the largest model, which is 120 billion parameters. This is GPT open source 120B. This is the one that's designed to run in data centers and on high end desktops and laptops. Now, of course, most people probably won't be able to run this because it does fit into a single H100 GPU with 117 billion parameters with 5.1 billion active parameters. But when we actually take a look at the second one, which is the small model, this is the one that most people are going to be using, which is the model that is for desktops and for laptops. So this is GPT 20B, which is a medium sized model that can run on most desktops and laptops. And I've tried it on my laptop. I've tried it on my desktop. It works pretty fine. So this is one for lower latency, local or specialized cases with only 20 billion parameters. Now, the open source thing was a surprise for everyone because OpenAI, it's literally in the name. Most people would have expected this company to be open source by now. But that wasn't the main thing that surprised everyone. And the thing about this is that we can see that these benchmarks are actually rivaling state-of-the-art systems that OpenAI has released. Now, in this video, I will speak a little bit about benchmarks. I usually try not to speak about benchmarks that much because it's not as interesting as most people think. And oftentimes it's just looking at numbers. But the only reason I'm actually going to pay attention here is because this is the first time in maybe, you know, years that OpenAI has actually released something that's open source that has the community looking at exactly where the models lie in terms of their raw capability. And we can really see here that you know, the 120 billion parameter model and even the 20 billion parameter model still performs at the level of O3 mini and around the levels of O3, despite being so much smaller in size, which is truly, truly remarkable when, you know, later in the video, I talk about the impacts of that. So of course, this is the code benchmark, which is competition code forces, uh, challenging code benchmark. So this is remarkably impressive. Once again, humanity's last exam. This is one of those benchmarks that is essentially designed to be really, really resistant to memory and all of those other things and other issues that come with the traditional benchmark saturation. Even this one, we can see here that the GPT open source models perform at the level or around similar to some of the O3 models, which is truly, truly remarkable. And I didn't think that we would get there with OpenAI, like genuinely, I didn't think we would get there, number one, because it's pretty difficult to do so. And number two, I just didn't think OpenAI would even want to release that. Now, when we look at other traditional benchmarks, we can see that I think it's safe to say now looking you know at this that uh when it comes to things like math that these benchmarks are simply completely saturated it's probably going to be the case that in future you know model videos and you know other paper releases that you know these benchmarks won't be used anymore because we're at around you know 98 percent 96 percent 99 percent in some cases um and i'm pretty sure some of those small percentages could be to human error so these benchmarks are completely saturated so when it comes to math the open source models are literally on par now one that is probably more up your street if you're actually going to be using these models on a day-to-day -day basis is the gpqa and the mmlu phd science level questions and the mmlu for standard questions and we can see that the GPT series models, the open source ones, literally perform at the level of O3 and O4 mini pretty much across the board. Now, I have been looking around and there have been some minor qualitative differences that we'll get into later. But currently looking at these, I have to say it is truly truly promising stuff from OpenAI. Now, there is one benchmark that I do want to take into account because this one is one that is often forgotten. Most people don't talk about this benchmark that much. And this is the Tau Bench Retail Function Calling. So most people don't know about this benchmark, but I love it because it's a benchmark that is based in reality, I guess you could say. So this benchmark is designed to evaluate the performance of AI agents in handling realistic retail customer service tasks such as order cancellation address changes returns exchanges and checking order status it essentially emulates dynamic multi-turn conversations between a simulated user and an ai agent requiring the ai agent to interact with 
provided API tools and adhere to domain specific policies. So this is one that, you know, kind of plays the role of a customer service agent with a bunch of tools. And it's what we're looking forward to because this is what a lot of agents are going to be used for in the future. And in this case, we can see here the 20 billion parameter model falls not that far behind O3 and O4 mini and the 120 billion parameter model really does do exceedingly well. Now, of course, I've been singing nothing but praises for the model for the largest part of this video, but I don't just want to give you guys the entire great side of things. I also want to present a balanced view because like I said before, I'm seeing certain areas where these models do have their issues. So let's dive into these several issues with the model. And this isn't to say that it's a model that you're not going to be using. I certainly will be using this model quite a lot. It's just that there are a few issues that you need to be aware of. So when you're picking LMs for specific usage, you're going to have to understand where you can place this one. So one of the key issues is that these models tend to hallucinate quite a bit. And so when we actually take a look at this right here, this is essentially the benchmarks, which are hallucination benchmarks. And before you freak out when I give you guys the numbers, these benchmarks are designed to elicit hallucinations. So before you guys freak out, just understand that these benchmarks are designed to really see where the models lie. But once again, we can see that there are really high hallucination rates for these models. We can see that, you know, the 20B model, it hallucinates in this specific benchmark, you know, 91% of the time, in this one, 53% of the time, and in this one, 49%. And of course, the larger model does it 78% of the time in that benchmark. Now, of course, the, you know, reasoning series of models, they do actually tend to hallucinate a lot more than the, you know, models that don't think. This is something that they've spoken about before. You know, they're still looking into this. So before you run ahead and use these models, do remember that there is hallucinations. You know, there are hallucinations that do occur. So of course, always fact check these outputs. Don't just blindly copy and paste them into an important document. You will need to double check and this is something that I've, you know, ingrained in my head because while the LLM produces outputs that sound correct, unless you're somewhat of an expert in that field, you're very likely to be fooled or caught off guard, especially since, you know, these models can hallucinate and it will happen to you as it's happened to me several times. So just be aware of that because these models aren't foolproof. Yes, they're good. Yes, they're amazing open source. Yes, you can run them on device, but they come with their issues. Now, there was also this, which is uh, EQ Bench. So I saw this on Twitter from Sam, and we can see here that essentially EQ Bench is something that I think does need a little bit more attention because the you know emotional side, you know the the emotional intelligence of these models is important for various use cases. Of course, I guess you could say that, you know, the quantitative benchmarks have been somewhat saturated. So it's important to look at the qualitative benchmarks. And in doing so, we can take a look at the EQ Bench 3. And it's very hard to see, but I will show you guys that GPT open source models are essentially not at the top. Now, I do also want to add here that this is probably somewhat of an unfair comparison because we're comparing open source models that were just released to essentially closed source state-of-the-art models that took millions and millions of dollars. But in this one right here, we can see that the GPT open source 120 billion parameter model is under DeepSeek V3, it's under DeepSeek R1, and it's under GLM 4.5 and Kimi K2 Instruct. So those were, you know, recently released models. Some of them are, you know, ones that have been around for a while, like the DeepSeek. And of course, the 20B model is actually all the way under some of these other models, like the Grok 3 Beta, the Gemma 3, the Grok 3 Mini, GPT 4.1 Nano. So it's important to understand that, you know, if you're going to be using it for maybe creative writing or the other use cases, make sure that you don't have access to a different model. Otherwise, you're better off using that other model in those use cases. Additionally, in creative writing, it doesn't seem to be doing the absolute best here. It's all the way down underneath these other models. You know, there's various, various different ones. You can pause the video, zoom in on your phone because it is a, uh, you know, a really detailed image. Don't want to spend too much time on it. And then of course we do have, you know, long form creative writing as well, where the model doesn't seem to exceed. Now, remember, like I said, it's an open source model. So if we did just open source models, I'm sure it'd probably be bumped up quite a bit, but there are some open source models that do perform better than this in these areas, like the Kimi K2, the DeepSeek R1. So it is interesting to see that. 
especially on these benchmarks. Now, additionally, of course, you can fine tune these models, which is going to open up a whole kind of worms and a whole, hopefully, different variation of use cases. But one of the things I want to talk about is, and this is probably one of the biggest things that I think nobody is talking about, is that this is largely the end of competition. Now, of course, you know, some people are still going to use other models. But what I mean is that like the deep seek fiasco, the entire deep seek thing where deep seek, you know, went to like, like crashed a trillion dollars off the stock market. And there was this huge fiasco. That entire thing happened because OpenAI's models are closed source and they're not open source, which means that people have to pay to use them. And that entire thing happened because DeepSeek released their model. It was better than ChatGPT at the time, and it was free. Now that OpenAI have done this, you have to understand that so many other companies were simply thriving off the back that OpenAI's models were closed source. But now that they've taken away that playing card, what will companies like Meta do? What will companies like Quen do? What will companies like DeepSeek do? Because now they're going to be forced to innovate even harder if OpenAI has open source offerings that are on their level or even better. OpenAI is going to retain more users because I can probably guarantee that the way OpenAI is going to release this open source model, the amount of support that they're going to have for developers just means that it's going to be largely easier to build with these models than any other model. So it's important to understand that. And I do think that this changes a lot because we're probably going to see a, a lot less from you know these other open source companies if OpenAI manages to dominate this area too. I mean, you know, one of the series that I really did like using was the Quen 3 series. But now looking at it, if OpenAI has got an open source model that is good, if not better, there would be no point to use the Quen series because there isn't that, you know, sense of, okay, this version is actually free and there aren't, you know, certain biases into it that maybe I might not like. So it's really, really important to understand that, you know, even DeepSeek R2 right now, like that was supposed to be the GPT-5 killer. Currently, the DeepSeek engineers have been working intensely over the past several months. And, you know, they aren't satisfied with the new model's performance, according to two people. So this is, you know, of course, not relating to OpenAI's open source model, but think about it, okay? If DeepSeek R2 really stun the world once again to take away the shine of GPT-5 and other series, they're gonna now really have to do a lot because opening eyes just taken away that playing card so for me this is a huge huge move and i do also think that this opens up just huge 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 areas for building with ai like this is going to be tremendous when it comes for you know for people who want to build businesses with ai when we take a look at you know what greg eisenberg tweeted you know this you know this entire document like i said all links will be in the description, but it means that, you know, certain industries, you know, where you need to have HIPAA compliant apps. I know so many people were building AI automations and stuff. It was just a real headache to actually get things to be compliant in certain areas due to, you know, data privacy laws and other things. But with these kind of, you know, rock solid open source models, it's going to be really easy to make things compliant, which means entire areas of market share have just opened. So once again, AI is about to eat the economy in ways that we haven't seen. So you can pause this, you can read this, don't want to, you know, read it for too long, but literally no more API costs. It's literally a one-time hardware investment. You know, no data is going to be leaving your device. It's going to be private by default. You know, it works offline, no internet requires. And remember guys, these are models that you can modify yourself. So if you're in the business of fine tuning models for companies, this is going to be a huge thing for you. I mean, it's pretty, pretty crazy. I mean, the government can use these. I mean, it's, it's just like the, the, the use cases here are just out of the world. So let me know what you guys think about this. I think this is pretty crazy. I think this definitely changes a lot and I'd love to see what you guys think about this.